Our guest today is from the great state of Texas. Dr. Chad Duplantis is a general dentist in Fort Worth, and he's become a very popular speaker in the field of digital dentistry, and particularly how to successfully incorporate digital dentistry into the private practice. Welcome, Chad. Well, thank you for having me. Great to have you here. You know, uh, for the folks uh, in the audience, let's talk a little bit about your background so they can get to know you a little, little bit better. Are you originally from Fort Worth? Originally, I'm from New Orleans, Louisiana, but I've lived in Texas for the majority of my life. So uh, after dental school, which I went to dental school at, in San Antonio, uh, my wife and I decided to settle in, in North Texas. So we've been in Dallas-Fort Worth for the past 20 years. And now back then when you did your schooling and you did your residency, was there any, any uh, education in the field of digital dentistry? None whatsoever. <laughs> it's not it, at all. It's funny that you ask. I was walking through the airport last Thursday and I ran into my operative dentistry professor and the dean of the dental school. And I of course he had he had aged quite a bit and I, I stopped him and and reintroduced myself and he, he remembered me and he said he said, Where are you headed? And I said, Well, I'm off to, to New Jersey to speak on, on CAD CAM dentistry and and he said he said, Oh my gosh, he says if you'd been at school, you know, 20 years later, he says, right now, he said, we've got so many CAD CAM devices and scanners and, and mills in the dental school. So that was really, really nice to hear that, that they're actually incorporating it now. But we, we had no idea what it was when I was in dental school. Things are changing. So, so how did you get interested in the whole field of, of digital dentistry? Well, uh, I bought a, a older uh, piece of equipment several years ago that many of us are still using today in, in 2004 and it was right after I got out of dental school and so I was trying to find a way at that time to eliminate my lab bill and and it worked however I, I probably tested the limits of the system and and didn't really use it to the capabilities that it was intended now, to. Now this was a system that was a scanner and mill scanner and, and mill, software right, all packaged right. together. Same day dentistry, uh, all packaged together. Um, and so I had, a, I had a humongous payment on the machine uh, and, and I just felt that I was kind of captive to the device and, and had to fabricate the restorations because I had this payment to make. And granted it was a great piece of equipment but I probably used it beyond its, its expectations. So after not producing the quality of dentistry that I wanted, I decided that I'd just give it up. So I ended up losing a lot of money on that, on that investment. So not, not giving up dentistry? Giving no, up not gi giving, up, giving up the equipment <laughs> and technology. So I, I just don't know that my practice was ready for it or, or I think I had false uh, perceptions as to, as to what it really was going to be in my office. So in, in 2007, I ventured out again and bought a digital impressioning device. And believe it or not, the digital impression device, it worked. Um, but I ended up sending it back because there were, it, it was very, very hard to learn. The products that I was receiving back from the laboratory were great, but um, I, I still kind of wanted to be able to mill a few and send a few off to the lab. So I had, I had my growing pains with that piece of technology, and so I ended up sending it back. And then in 2012, I still had the inkling that I, and the earn, yearning that I wanted to participate in CAD CAM dentistry and incorporate it in my office. And so in 2012, I was approached by 3M to beta test their new true definition scanner. And I was a little reluctant at first, but they told me that it would not now communicate with a mill. So when I found out that it would communicate with a mill, which is something that I had, had enjoyed doing in the past, but I didn't enjoy doing exclusively, I thought, well, I'll give it a, give it a go. And uh, I haven't stopped since. It's been the best addition that I've added to my office since I've been in practice since about 2000. So uh, it's really the perfect mix for me to be able to send stuff off to the lab or send cases off to the lab, I should say, and to be able to uh, mill cases in the office. Right, right. So. You know, I just had the opportunity to hear you speak at the uh, two-day symposium on dental de digital dentistry at the uh, Glidewell International Training Center. And that's a point that you made very well several times in, in your, in your uh, lectures, that it's great to have the opportunity to mill in the office, but it's not what you do exclusively. You talked a little bit about sort of a 50-50 a concept. Right, I think the 50-50 concept is a, great, is a great concept in what works well in my office. You know, there's a lot of people that want to 
mill exclusively. There's a lot of people that want to scan impressions exclusively, and I like a mix. I never really intended to be a lab tech. I just intended to provide quality dentistry. Yeah. Um, and, and I do like the hands-on aspect. I like designing the restorations. Believe it or not, I, I liked waxing restorations in dental school, so I still get to do that and have a little bit of fun. But if there's a case that, that I think the patient is going to be better served by sending it off to the laboratory, I'm able to do that as well. So I like the, the openness and the availability that I have. So, so, so Chad, you mentioned this 50-50 uh, this concept, and you spoke about it at the, uh, at the symposium, and, and it's, it's, uh, you have certain, certain cases that you like to mill in the office and certain cases that you like to send out to a commercial labs. What are your decision points on, on which are for in-office milling and which you like to send out? Well, I think the greatest benefit of the in-office mill is the ability to offer same-day dentistry. So that's, that's one thing that you always take into account, but you have to do what's best for the patient. So it, same day dentistry, although you'd like to be able to offer it, you can't always do it. Now, with that being said, let's go to what I, what I would choose, you know, uh, as far as the patient or the aesthetics or, or what as to what, what the decision factor would be. Anterior teeth, the majority of them I'm gonna to send to the laboratory because I trust the technicians at the laboratory to stain and glaze those restorations and to characterize them to my patient's specific needs better than I would be able to. If I were to do it in the office, not that I don't trust the material, but it would take a lot longer and it would certainly wouldn't be for several units of anterior teeth, same day dentistry, it just wouldn't be practical. Now for a posterior tooth, if it's, if it's a tooth in the aesthetic zone, where the patient's going to be able to see it, that I really don't want to put the extra effort into staining and glazing. I'll send that case to the laboratory as well. And, you know, if, if I don't have the time in the day or the patient wasn't pressed for a, a same day restoration, I'll send those restorations off to the laboratory as well. So there's several factors that go into it, but, you know, same day would be great for every patient. You just got to know your limitations. You got to know the patient's limitations, and you you've got to know the patient's expectations. Chad, you mentioned that you you started very early with um, intraoral scanning, and in fact, you actually had a, a couple of false starts. Right. So so as we talk about a doctor successfully incorporating this technology into his practice, how would you say a doctor is uh, will know that his practice is ready to incorporate that technology? Well, first of all, I ignore my false starts because that was all on me. However, I think that the technology has advanced to the point that there's, there's not too many doctors out there that aren't ready to incorporate the technology into their office. I think that the workflow has been proven. I think the, the quality of restoration that you're receiving from the digital scans is superior to what we're receiving with traditional impressions. Um, I think the timing of, of the, the procedures is decreased, and I think that the timing in return from the laboratories has decreased. And I think the quality is just so superior. So I think that it, once you see all of these things and you actually start using it in your office, it's a very easy transition. So as I stated before, I don't think that there's too many doctors out there that aren't ready for it. They've just got to be receptive to hear the benefits of it. So there's, there's a huge uh, group of doctors that are so fearful of, of the way it used to be in the past with the cost and the difficulty and, and having to provide same day dentistry when a lot of doctors actually don't want to do that. And now the openness of the systems allows them to do whatever they want. So they just need to be receptive to listening. And I think everybody should be ready to incorporate mm -hmm. this technology. Great, great. And then as you take the next step to in-office milling, uh, I would ask you the same question. H how does a, a practitioner know that he's ready to incorporate that successfully? Well, there's, there's a lot, there's a greater number of doctors that aren't ready to incorporate in-office milling than, than there are that aren't ready to incorporate scanning. So I think milling is where the dynamics change. And I think that a doctor can provide quality restorations with the in-office milling. I think that the workflows once again are proven. I think the materials are proven. But it's got to be a doctor that likes to work with their hands, that likes to play with technology, that likes to provide that same-day service to patients. 
uh, that does want to reduce their lab bill somewhat because you will be able to reduce it. I think it's got to be a, an innovative doctor that's, that's, re that's ready to incorporate the in-office milling. But I think, you know, scanning is kind of the gateway to that. And, you know, once they start scanning, if they can at least cross that hurdle, then I think that their receptiveness to milling would be a lot greater. And I think there would be a lot, you know, greater potential that they would incorporate that into their office. You know, a lot of doctors have said to me that one of the reasons they like in-office milling is because of the degree of control that they, they have, right? So, so they can personally set what their contacts are, what the occlusion will be, what the buccal contours will be, things like that. Has that been a benefit for you? It's a huge bit of control. That's a huge benefit. You know, you have complete control of the rest, restoration that goes in the patient's mouth. And, you know, that's, that's, that's a great benefit to have in your, in your office. Um, so I, I would have to agree that that's... Yeah. So um, you mentioned that you had experience with several different in-office milling devices, and now you're using the uh, TS-150 from iOS. Can you tell me what got you interested in that scanner and, and what your experience has been working with it? Well, when you've got a... First of all, it's backed by Glidewell. So Glidewell's such a huge lab, such a dynamic lab. They, they put a lot of research into everything that they do, and they provide a great product. So when you've got a mill that's backed by Glidewell, that already sends up some lights that, hey, this might be something to look at. Uh, the second thing that got me interested is the price point. You know, you can, you can get into to milling with the, the TS-150 mill and, and, you know, not have to pull a second mortgage on the house or, or your practice to do so. It's a very affordable investment. And for my practice, the thing that really intrigued me is that there's not a lot of milling options, so you don't have this milling overwhelm, overwhelming feeling of, you know, when you get to it as to what material you're going to use, you only have a few options. So in my practice, that works best. I don't want a cafeteria menu full of options. I want to have a few things that are proven, that work, that have great strengths, great aesthetics, and that will be a quality restoration in my patient's mouth. So that was a huge drawing point of the TS-150 mill. Now on top of that, the majority of us are placing full zirconia restorations in patient's mouths on posterior teeth. And then you've got a mill that's at a great price point, then whoa, it can mill zirconia. Hey, that's huge. Yeah. So I think that on top of all of the other things that I mentioned, I think zirconia is the largest drawing factor for, for a lot of dentists that are considering it out there you know, hey, we can do this in our office now. What a great addition to offer our patients. Well, let's talk a little bit about, about the materials sure. because I understand the variety of materials that you can, you can mill with the TS-150 has, uh, has been growing pretty steadily. Sure. What, what are the materials that, that you're using mostly? I use, the majority of what I mill is obsidian, uh, the lithium silicate material. Uh, it's a wonderful material. It's got great strength. It's got great aesthetics. It, it mills beautifully. It comes out of the mill beautifully. And, and patients seem to love it. I feel comfortable putting that on all premolars and molars, inlays, onlays, full coverage restorations. And then I'm milling this Bruxer now, which of course, if, if anybody that's watching this has used Glidewell, they know what Bruxer is, but Bruxer now is what you can mill in your office. It's got incredible strength. It's slightly less than what you can get from the laboratory, but it's way more than you'd ever need in, a, in, in, a, in the typical setting. Um, it's, it is a full zirconium uh, material. It's pre-centered, so it, it's just a beautiful so product. pre-centered meaning that you do not have to put that in an oven after it's milled? No, it mills and it polishes and it's ready to go. So there's no shrinkage that you have to be concerned about. There's no additional firing following pu pulling it out of the mill and it's ready to go in the patient's mouth. It's, it's a wonderful restoration to be able to offer to a patient, especially in a same day setting. And let's say on, on a posterior tooth, what's, what's your decision point of, let's say, obsidian versus, versus Bruxer now? For, for my practice, if it's a second molar and it's a full coverage restoration, they're going to get Bruxer now. If it's a first molar and it's a full coverage restoration, it really depends. If the patient is a Bruxer, they're going to get a Bruxer now, most likely. Or if I'm concerned about their occlusal forces, you know, large large men have a tendency to, to, to break things, so I, 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 I would put Bruxer now in that situation. 
Uh, if the patient doesn't have extremely heavy occlusal forces, I feel very confident putting uh, obsidian in the patient's mouth. Uh, obsidian is, is a little bit more aesthetic, a little bit more tooth-like when you look at it. Not that Bruxer now is not, but obsidian is clearly a more aesthetic material. It's, it's designed to be such. So it's a little bit of a trade-off. You, you trade off a little bit of translucency to get significantly greater Exactly. Translucency, translucency is the key in, in, in the obsidian. And then for uh, premolars, I'll, I'll use exclusively obsidian. So now for inlays and onlays, I do mill a couple of other materials. I'll use Vita Enamic, which is a nice material. I use Lava Ultimate, which is a nice material. Uh, but those are mainly for inlays and onlays. Inlays and onlays, okay. So for, for full crown coverage, it's uh, Bruxer now or it's Obsidian? Yes. Great, great. Um, Chad, we spoke earlier and you mentioned that you restore a fair number of implant cases. How do you incorporate implants into the digital workflow? You know, that's my favorite aspect of the digital workflow and it's, it's really been great to, it's, it's been a great addition to have the scanner in the office for, for implants. Uh, each implant manufacturer has a scan body, and I believe uh, Glidewell manufactures scan bodies for several implant manufacturers. But the scan body, you know, attaches to the to the to the implant, and you scan that, and it it determines the or the lab can determine from that scan the interface of the implant and where the abutment will will be. So it's sort of like the digital version of an impression coping. Digital version of a of an old custom abutment impression coping. So, it it's been a wonderful workflow for our office. Uh, the beauty of it, and and the hardest part to wrap your head around it, is that you can have the abutment being made while the crown's being made, and those two will merge uh, on a lab tech's you know desk to verify the fit, and then in your office, and and it's a flawless workflow. It, it works absolutely beautifully. We're, we're receiving restorations back digitally a lot quicker than we were when we were doing traditional impressions with the implant workflow, but it's just been a great addition to our office and, and it's been a lot of fun. You're getting a, a beautiful custom abutment. You're getting beautiful restoration. You can do any type of custom abutment. You can do any type of restoration on it. There's, there's, it's limitless as far as what you can do. And another th nice thing about the scanner in the implant workflow is if you're working with a surgeon, I, as you asked, I, I do not place implants, but I restore them. But I also work with our surgeons on where we want the implants placed. So we'll actually scan the patient preoperatively and we'll take a CBCT scan and that data will merge together in, in software that, that has the capability of doing that. We'll plan the implant uh, placement, we'll plan a temporary restoration, we'll fabricate the temporary restoration, fabricate the implant's guided stent, and the surgery's performed, the patient's delivered a temporary the same day of the implant surgery, and it's just a beautiful workflow, a beautiful service to offer the patient, and in addition, the healing is just better for the patient since they have a temporary that was that was fabricated especially for that site. Right. So it's a wonderful workflow. Well, that's great, that's great. You know, as I talk to our colleagues around the country who, who are involved in digital dentistry, uh, a lot of them uh, have some concerns that, you know, the model is optional, right? right. As you mentioned, the, you can get an abutment from, from, uh, from one mill and get a crown from another mill, maybe even a different lab, sure. and they go together and there's, and there's no model involved. How have you adapted to uh, modelless digital dentistry? You know, it was a hard shift because I had a little, you know, pregame routine I went through when I went to see the restoration that I used the model for. And, and the first case I sent to Glidewell, I, I sent it and, and didn't receive a model. And, and, you know, my mind was a little bit blown, but the restoration, you know, and I kept looking for that model and didn't have it. The restoration seated beautifully. It, it fit perfectly. And so after the first few, I realized that the savings from not having the model was, was of course, a great thing, but the model really wasn't necessary, you know. Uh, I think that the even harder, uh, you know, leap of faith was when we received this, we don't do this very often, but there was one time there was a little miscommunication on our behalf from the lab as to what we wanted. We received an abutment and a restoration with no model. And that to me was just, that, I just couldn't comprehend that one, but the restoration and the abutment seated beautifully. So I, I, 
you know, I still prefer models on my implant restorations, and that's just because sometimes you can't teach an old dog new tricks, and it's something that I'm used to. But I think that you know, not having a a model is 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 really not a bad thing, and it's it's you know something that you should try and and do a few times, and I, I promise you won't be disappointed. I, I love your term, uh, the pregame ritual. Yes, because that's exactly what it is. You know, you, we like to look at the crown on the model right. and look at the contacts and and look at how it hits against the, the opposing. But the, the truth of the matter is those things have already been looked at digitally and they've all already been set in the software and, and in the mill. So, so it's kind of interesting. And of course the significant cost savings that you realize by not having a model uh, probably makes up for some of the Absolutely. need to change habits. Absolutely. Tell me a little bit about your practice. Well, we're a, a we like to call ourselves an aesthetic and restorative practice, um, which those two terms kind of go hand in hand. But we we treat patients of all ages. We treat you know children that you know I started seeing in my practice or are now off to college and 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 married and some are having children of their own and I treat the elderly and the young and and all ages in between. There's nine staff members and two doctors. I have a partner that that I joined in 2003. And he has been in practice in the Fort Worth area since 1987, and it's just been a great transition. We feed off of one another. We we practice by the motto that that two eyes are better than one, and four are certainly better than two. <laughs> so we, we use each other a lot in our in our clinical decision making and treatment planning, and it's it's wonderful to have that camaraderie amongst the both of us, and we just have a wonderful staff that's been in place for a so long time. So you mentioned that your, your partner is, is a bit senior to you. Yes. And uh, we know that doctors adopt technology at different rates. Has, has that been an issue in your practice? Let's say you might be faster to adopt certain things, and, and he comes along. Yeah, you know, I, 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 I love the guy dearly, but he was very uh, hesitant to adopt the technology, and that's partially because he saw our failures with the first two systems that we had. And so when this new technology came in, he was interested, but he really was, wasn't ready to, to completely embrace it. So we've had it since 2012, and, and you know I, I would catch him occasionally peeking into the operatory to see what's going on. And then you know he'd think about scanning a little bit, and then he'd, he'd, he'd not think about scanning. But one of the, the key factors that that really piqued his interest was we he had a, a complex implant case with several units and it it happened to be on his his wife and I said hey I said you just gotta scan this case and let's send it to Glidewell and let's see how it goes and, and, and get it back and so he's like okay so we, we you know I gave him the scan bodies he put the scanner in there and he scanned it, sent it off, it came back, it dropped beautifully, and he's exclusively <laughs> scanning all of his implant cases now. And he's starting to scan some crown and bridge, and this past week I helped him fabricate his first chair side restoration, and, and it, was, it dropped beautifully. So it's, it's been a slower shift for him, but now that he's seeing the merits of the equipment in the office, I think that he's really gonna start using it with, with much greater frequency. And I think that it'll be a great addition to his practice as well as mine. And I'm, and I'm hoping he gets to the point of using it enough where we have to purchase a second scanner, <laughs> so. Yeah, well, it sounds like you're both benefiting from the partnership. Absolutely. And you mentioned you had nine staff members? Nine staff members. Nine staff members. And, and how has this uh, adoption of new technology worked out for them? You know, they, whenever I tell them I'm bringing something new into the office, it doesn't matter how small or how big it is, I get the eye roll because they know me well enough to know that some of the things last and they become part of our everyday routine and some of them get stuck in a closet. Yeah, let's dig in and maybe yeah. this will all blow over. Yeah, <laughs> and so they rolled their eyes when I brought the scanner in because you know that my staff's been with me a long time. They were there for the first and the second go around and now they're there for the third. And you know, we started using it and, and you know, I was determined this time that you know, we're gonna make it work to, Workflow's proven, technology's there, let's do this. And my staff has really embraced the technology. And, and when we had the scanner in 2007, I would say place the scanner in the room. 
and I walk in the room and the scanner would be in the hallway and the impression material would be next to the patient because they knew that's what I was going to do anyways. You know, it was going to be easier, it was going to be quicker. Well now, I don't even have to tell them. The scanner's in the room, it's ready to go, and there's a lot of cases that my staff, you know, had, had coaxed me into in the early ongoings of using the scanner as to, I think we should try to scan this. I would have never done my first partial with a scanner unless my staff said, I think we should try and scan this. My first night guard, she says, I, I, my, my assistant, I think we should try and scan this. And so everything that we're doing, we're scanning. And they're loving it, I'm loving it, and you know, so it's, it, they've really embraced the technology. That's great. That's great. So Chad, once again, I, I really appreciate the, the excellent presentations that you gave during our, our digital dentistry symposium, and, and I appreciate the effort that you're making throughout the profession to, to sort of bring all of us into the, into the, uh, the future. Um, what do you see as the, the, as the trends coming up? What's, what's the next thing in digital dentistry? You know, yesterday I, I showed a slide and I had several of the scanners in the marketplace. And what started off as a slide over the past couple of years with two or three images on it is now almost full and I still don't have all of the scanners. When you get to the mills, I think that, you know, that slide once again is, is full now and it's kind of, it's, it's rolling off of the edge. And so I think that the competition in the marketplace is going to, it, it is, is going to force the manufacturers to really beef up their game and I think there's a lot of behind the scenes stuff going on so that someone can stake their claim that they're the best, they're the most accurate, they're the market leader. I think there's a lot of changes which creates a lot of confusion but there's a lot of good products on the market and if it's not a good product, product it's not going to make it to the market. I see the cost of the units possibly even coming down as, as, as time goes on. But, you know, of course, I think there's a limit to how far they can come down. I see the laboratories almost going exclusively digital. I, I, they've already embraced the technology. It's benefited them, whereas before it, it really hurt them. So I, I just see a lot of change in, in the future, and I think it's all going to be for the good. I think that the indications are just going to com continue to open up amongst the scanners, amongst the mills. I think the milling choices are going to be greater. I think the future is bright for digital dentistry and, and for, for clinical dentistry in general. Well, some so. great thoughts. Thank you so much for joining us today, and thanks for your participation in the uh, symposium. You bet. Had a blast. Thank you.